Ladies and gentlemen, in a previous video, I have talked to you about how to derive the Schwarzschild metric for a Schwarzschild spacetime around a spherically symmetric object. And if you haven't seen that video already, I'll link that video in the description and with this video as well. There should be a pop-up link appearing right now. Once you have got that, in this video, by the way, we're going to delve right into the physics of the Schwarzschild spacetime and the best way to do that is to examine the phenomenon of gravitational redshift in this background which is the Schwarzschild background. Now in the next video of course I'm going to show you the general formula or the general way of deriving the formula for gravitational redshift in arbitrary spacetime, but for now we focus solely on the gravitational redshift in Schwarzschild metric. And we try to achieve that goal in the simplest way possible, which is to take an observer and an emitter, both of whom are stationary and therefore have fixed spatial coordinates. So let us draw the figure and analyze how that plays out. Two things to be noted before we go on with our calculation. One to redefine this constant here, uh, which at least in some sense uh, simplify the burden of writing down the same factor again and again. And the second thing is that in the metric, as we can see, uh, there is a coefficient uh, with the time part and as we shall see this plays a significant role because uh, the proper time and the coordinate time they will not match and the reason they will not match largely owes its credit to this factor here. So this factor will become a uh, major contributor in determining the exact expression for the gravitational redshift. So um, with that being told, let's go on to uh, look at the figure uh, that will greatly simplify our discussion. And at the same time, it will give us an intuitive understanding of what is actually going on in this situation. So here we have the schematic illustration of two observers, basically the world line of two observers, uh, one drawn in the blue color and the other drawn in the red color. And what is happening is that uh, both of these observers are stationary. So the special coordinates are signified by uh, the quantities that's been written here and here. So this one is the one line of the emitter and it has the special coordinate R e, theta e and phi e, all of whom are constant. So that means they are not moving in the space. They are only moving or rather translating in the time direction. The same goes on for the receiver as well. Its special coordinates are not also changing and it's only moving forward in time. So at some time TE, this emitter here, he releases a light signal or a photon. Uh, and as we know, photons follow the null geodesic. So here, as we can see from this figure, this is the null geodesic. And uh, this is the geodesic that photons follow. And uh, this photo arrives to the receiver at the coordinate time TR. So by the way, all of these are happening uh, from the perspective of an observer uh, with respect to whom both of these uh, emitter and receiver, both of them are stationary. Uh, the emitter uh, releases another photon in the coordinate time TE plus delta TE. And that also follows a null geodesic. And that photon is received by the receiver at the coordinate time TR plus delta TR. Now, we do not know for sure whether this delta TE and uh, delta TR 
the time interval between the release of the two signals uh, by the emitter and the time difference uh, between the receiving of the two signals by the receiver, whether they are the same or not. So this is something we'll have to check. But what we are most interested in is to find out uh, the ratio of the proper time interval, that is to say delta tau, which is where tau is the proper time of the emitter, so delta tau e, divided by delta tau r, which is the proper time with uh, for the receiver, and this ratio would determine the factor of gravitational redshift which we would like to figure out. So first, we try to find out the difference between the two times, which is precisely the receiving time minus the emission time. So this is the difference. This is the difference between receiving time and the emission time. So, in order to find that out, we first need to take the null geodesic. And along this path, we know the space-time interval is zero, which for this null line is c squared times 1 minus 2 mu divided by r dt squared with a negative sign, plus 1 minus 2 mu divided by r, inverse d r squared, plus r squared d omega squared, but this is the metric of two sphere, or in explicit term, d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. Since this is equal to zero, we can take the time part to the left side, which gives us c squared 1 minus 2 mu over r dt squared. And on the other side, we have 1 minus 2 mu divided by r all to the power negative 1 d r squared plus r squared d omega squared. At this stage, let us choose some affine parameter sigma. Remember, we cannot take the proper time as the affine parameter because the proper time is zero along the null curve. But we can take any other affine parameter uh, which appropriately parameterize this uh, photon geodesic. So we choose sigma to be the affine parameter. Parameter. And with the help of that, we can take the square root of the equation we have written before, and then we divide by d sigma, which allows us, after some trivial algebra, 1 over c times 1 minus 2 mu divided by r all to the power negative 1 half is because uh, we have sent the factor we had with dt to the other side and of course the special coordinate can be written as g i j and then i have d x i d sigma times d x j d sigma and with an overall square root. And you know, uh, in explicit term, this is simply 1 minus 2 mu divided by r inverse uh, d r squared and then r squared d omega squared. The special part that we uh, wrote earlier. And if we integrate over it, we get uh, t r minus t e, and on the other side, we can factor out this 1 over c, and then in the lower bound corresponding to this time, we can write the 
parametric value for the emitting time and in the upper limit we have to write the parametric value of the receiving time and inside we have d sigma and then 1 minus 2 mu divided by r all to the power negative 1 and then we have g i j d x i d sigma d x j d sigma and once again the quantity inside the square bracket is the quantity that is written in the middle let me box this quantity here and this is precisely the special part notice that on the right hand side we have everything in terms of the special coordinate and we know that along the path the none of the participants in this physical settings move specially and therefore we can take any interval and this thing on the right will be the same which in turn also implies that the time separation between receiving the two signals should be the same as the time separation between the emission of the two signals. This is an interesting fact. So that means the coordinate time interval between uh, the emission of the signals and the receiving of the signals are going to be the same. They do not change. Now the question becomes what about the proper time along the word line? And if I figure out the proper time for uh, the emitter and the proper time for the receiver, the question is, do they differ? And intuitively, they should differ because the proper time will be a multiple of the coordinate time, but that multiple or rather that coefficient is space dependent. And it is that space dependence, as we'll see shortly, that causes the discrepancy of the time intervals in terms of the proper time. So let us check that out. So in case of the proper time along the word lines, first let's take the emitter. So we know that this squared is simply 1 minus 2 mu divided by r and this is the position of the emitter so we'll have to use a subscript times delta t e squared. What about the other part? Those part goes away because dr and the d theta and d phi, that means the changes in the special coordinates, they amounts to zero. Because remember, neither the emitter nor the receiver move in terms of the special coordinates. And the same argument holds for the receiver as well. So that means delta tau r which is the proper time interval squared, should be equal to 1 minus 2 mu divided by r, r, which is the position of the receiver, and then we have delta t, r squared. Now, of course, we can take the ratio of these two quantities. So we have the delta tau e divided by delta tau r squared, which gives us 1 minus twice mu divided by re divided by 1 minus twice mu divided by rr times delta t e squared divided by delta t r squared but remember these quantities are the same so they cancel each other this in turns implies that delta t e divided by delta t r, this time we take the square root, leaves us the result 1 minus 2 mu divided by r e, whole divided by 1 minus 2 mu divided by r r, with an overall square root. And since the frequency is inversely proportional to the time period, this uh, gives us the inverse ratio for the frequencies, which is nu r, the frequency of the signal, measured by the receiver, divided by mu e, which is the frequency measured by the emitter. 
Finally, one crucial thing we need to mention in this video is the quantity called the redshift parameter. The redshift parameter is denoted by Z, and in terms of the frequency, it is defined by the following formula. This is basically the frequency measured by the emitter minus the frequency measured by the receiver divided by the frequency measured by the receiver. And as can be seen here, this can be simplified as new E divided by new R minus 1. So with the help of this quantity or the expression we have here, we can find out the explicit expression for the redshift parameter in the Schwarzschild spacetime. And of course, this is given by 1 minus 2 mu divided by RR, all divided by 1 minus 2 mu divided by RE, with an overall square root minus 1. And this concludes this video on the gravitational redshift in Schwarzschild spacetime. I hope to meet you on the next video. Until then, subscribe to this channel. Bye bye.